section thirty six of marion harlan's complete etiquette this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen marion harlan's complete etiquette by marion harland courtesy from the young to the old the pessimist reading the heading of this chapter would be inclined to ask if one writes nowadays of a lost quantity while we do not consider the grace of courtesy as entirely lost we are at times tempted to think that it has gone before and so far before that it is lost sight of by the rising generation the days have passed when the hoary head was a crown of glory as the royal preacher declares it is certain that if it is a crown it is one before which the youth of the twentieth century do not always bow before we condemn the young unsparingly for their lack of reverence we must look at the other side of the question to-day there are few old people first there is youth that lasts almost until one is a grandparent then one is middle-aged no one is old at least few will acknowledge it the woman of forty-five is on the shady side of thirty she of sixty-five is on the downslope from fifty and even when the age is announced one is reminded that a woman is only as old as she feels there is sound common sense in all this cannot we afford to snap our fingers at father time and his laws when the law within ourselves tells us that we are young in heart in feeling in aims so the principle that bids us shut our eyes at the figure on the milestone we are passing is a good one as long as we feel fresh still for the journey as long as every step is a pleasure what difference if the walk has been five miles long or fifteen we judge of the strain by the effect it has had on us if we feel unwearied and ready for miles and miles ahead of us who shall say that the walk has been ten miles long when we are conscious in our energetic limbs that it has only been two delightful miles no one is old now the fact that no one is now old has its effect on the young person in our midst she hesitates to say to the matron take this seat please when she knows that in her soul the matron will resent the insinuation that she is on the downward grade not long ago i witnessed the chagrin of a woman of thirty-five who rose and gave her seat in a stage to a woman who was if one may judge by the false standard of appearances at least fifteen years her senior the elderly woman flushed indignantly pray keep your seat madam she commanded in stentorian tones i may be gray-headed but i am not old or decrepit i fancy that one reason gray hair is becoming fashionable is this desire to cling to youth every year more young women tell us that they are prematurely gray and their sister women add eagerly so many women are nowadays the importance of tact our young person must then be very careful how she displays the feeling of reverence for age which we would like to believe is inherent in every well-regulated nature she must exercise tact without which no person will have popularity appreciating one's elders one point in which young america displays lamentable vulgarity is in the habit of interrupting older people interruptions we of a former generation were taught are rude that is a forgotten fact in many so-called polite circles and when people do not interrupt they seem to be waiting for the person speaking to finish what he has to say in order to cut in no other expression describes it fitly with some new and original remark that is apparently the only reason that one listens to others just for the sake of having some one to answer the world is full of things and getting fuller every day and unless one talks most of the time he will never be able to air his opinions on all points and every one's opinion is of priceless value at least to himself this seems to be the attitude of young america yet in courtesy to the hoary head one should occasionally pause long enough to allow the owner thereof to express an opinion although one has passed fifty one may nevertheless have sound judgment and ideas on some subjects that are worth consideration 
i wish young men and women would occasionally remember this the woman of sixty or over can really learn little of value from her granddaughter even when that granddaughter is a college graduate and has all the arrogance of twenty years of course grandmother may need enlightenment on college athletics on golf even perhaps on bridge although that is very doubtful if she lives in a fashionable neighborhood but after all these are not the greatest things of life she would perchance be glad to listen to her young relatives accounts of her sports if she would take the trouble to tell the happenings that interest her in a loving respectful spirit our elderly woman does not like to be patronized to be told that she dresses like an old-fashioned plate and that she is to use the slang of the day a back number the grandmother knows better she has lived and she is sure that from her store of knowledge of life of men women and things as they really are she could bring forth treasures new and old that would be of great help to the hot-headed impulsive young girl about to risk all on the perilous journey that lies before her i would therefore suggest that our girl practice deference toward her elders at first she may not find it easy but it is worth cultivating it is moreover much more becoming than arrogance and aggressiveness too common nowadays there is something wrong when a person feels no respect for one who has attained to double or treble her years there is something lacking the collegians of both sexes would do well to turn their analytical minds on themselves and as improvement is the order of the day add to their fund of becoming attainments the sweet old-fashioned attribute of courtesy and reverence toward age small courtesies it is easy after all if one will watch carefully to do the little kind thing that makes for comfort and not to do it aggressively it is not necessary to adjust a pillow at the elderly person's back as if she needed it i saw a sweet woman put a pillow behind an invalid with such tact that the sufferer who was acutely sensitive on the subject of her condition did not suspect that her hostess had her illness in mind my dear said this tactful woman if you are built as i am you must find that chair desperately uncomfortable without a cushion behind you i simply will not sit in it without this little bit of a pillow wedged in at the small of my back i find it so much more comfortable so that i am sure you will and the cushion was adjusted could even supersensitive and suspicious old age have resented such attention of course elderly people like to talk why should they not be allowed to do it the boy or girl listener is impatient of what he or she terms inwardly garrulousness is not the prattle of youth as trying to old people but to do them justice unless they are very crabbed they listen to it kindly unfortunately one seldom sees a young person rise and remain standing when an old person enters the room yet to loll back in a chair under such circumstances is one of the greatest rudenesses of which a girl or boy is capable the old man generosity to age right here may i put in a plea for the old man in the first place he is not so popular as the old woman she is often beloved he poor soul is too often endured in very truth he is not so lovable as his lady wife he did not take the time while he was young to cultivate the little niceties of life as she did women have more regard for appearances than men have and their life is not spent so often in counting room and office they are in their daily life surrounded by refined persons more than are their husbands they do not have to talk by the hour with rough men give orders to surly underlings eat at lunch counters and join in the morning and evening rush for life to get a seat on the crowded car or train where the law is suave qui coûte or in brutal english every man for himself no matter who for the hindmost all these things after years and years influence the man or woman it is inevitable it even affects the inner life 
the book of books tells us that though the outward man perish the inward man is renewed day by day sometimes the inward man is hardly worth renewing at the end of a life of such rush and mad haste after the elusive dollar that there has been no place for the gentle amenities of existence therefore as the man gets old his nature comes to the front and too often the courtesies that were pinned on him by a loving wife and kept polished up by her drop off and he does not want to bother to have them readjusted consequently he often has habits that are not pretty he is irascible he is intolerant with youth and now that he is laid aside he likes to tell of what he did when he was as active as the young men about him dear young people let him talk listen to him and remember that at your age he was just as agreeable as you consider too that if when you are old you would escape being the self-absorbed being you think him you would do well now to begin to avoid the selfishness and self-absorption that you find make the old man objectionable practice on him and he will in his old age still be doing a good work a word to the wise it is not pleasant to feel old to know that you are set aside in the minds of others as a has-been there are few more cruel lessons given to human beings to learn in this hard school we call life and this task has to be learned when strength and courage wane and the grasshopper is a burden if young people would only make it unnecessary for the older person to acquire it it lies with youth to make the declining years of those near the end of the journey a weary waiting for that end or a peaceful loitering on a road that shall be a foretaste of a land in which no one ever grows old end of section thirty six section thirty seven of marion harland's complete etiquette this is a LibriVox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathleen. Marion Harland's Complete Etiquette by Marion Harland. Mistress and Maid. They were not foreordained from all eternity to be sworn enemies. Could that fact be impressed on the mind of each, there would be less friction between them. Where? in this day and in this country is found the family servant who follows the fortunes of her employers through adversity and evil report asking only to be allowed to live among those who have shown her kindness who have taught her all she knows and who have been kinder to her than her own family have been she may exist in the imagination of the optimistic novelist but not in reality once in a great while such a servant well advanced in life is found but she is a rara avis on the other hand it should be remembered that the burden of blame and of responsibility for improvement rests with the woman of larger opportunity if we heard considerably more of the mistress problem we should probably hear less of the servant one both must help it is tried to say that in this country the servant matter is all askew we know that and it is incumbent on us to make the best of matters as we find them to do this both mistress and maid should be impressed with the fact expressed in the opening sentence of this chapter as matters now are the maid sees in the mistress a possible tyrant one who will exact the pound of flesh and if the owner thereof be not on her guard will insist on a few extra ounces thrown in for good measure the mistress sees in the suspicious girl a person who will if the chance be offered her turn against her employer will do the smallest amount of work possible for the highest wages she can demand break china smash glass shut her eyes to dirt in the corners and accept the first opportunity that offers itself to leave her present place and get one that demands fewer duties and larger pay one of the greatest mistakes of the mistress is that she lets the state of affairs greatly disturb her why should she the maid is not her own kind 
and the woman is wrong who judges the uneducated ill-reared hireling by the rules that govern the better educated classes the servant and the employer have been reared in different worlds and to ignore this fact is folly how often do we see the mistress hurt because of nora's lack of consideration for her and her time and vexed because the servant fails to appreciate any kindness shown her let her accept the condition of affairs as what the slangy boy would call part of the game and not waste god-given nerve and energy in worrying over it if she gets reasonably good return in work for the wages she pays she should be content if a woman's maid does something wrong or omits a duty however important if guests are present the mistake should be remedied as quietly as possible and without reproof to rebuke a servant before others is a great unkindness to her and needlessly embarrasses the visitor expect the best always be considerate the mistress should not expect a friend and counsellor in the maid once in a while one meets a servant who by some accident is capable of discerning the refinement of nature in her employer and of respecting it in this case she will care more for the employer for knowing that she is trusted it is a fact that by appealing to the best in human nature be that nature american irish german or scandinavian we elicit the best from our fellow creatures let the mistress then try to believe in the good intentions of her servant or if she cannot really believe in them let her attempt to do so her attitude of mind will unconsciously to herself make itself felt upon her helper let her take it for granted that the new girl means to stay is honest trustworthy and anxious to please and let her talk to her as if all these things were foregone conclusions she may show by gentle manner and kindly consideration that nora or gretchen is a sister woman not a machine if a washing or ironing happens to be heavy let her suggest a simple dessert of fruit instead of the pudding that had been planned and if the maid's heavy eyes and forced smile show that she is not well let the mistress for a brief moment put herself in the place of the hireling and think what she would want done for her under similar circumstances she will then suggest that some of the work that can be deferred be laid aside until the following day or offer to give a hand in making the beds or dusting the rooms but declares the systematic housewife i do not hire a servant and then do my housework no neither did you hire your maid of all work to be a sick nurse but were you ill it would be she who would cook your meals carry up your tray and take care of you unless you were so ill as to need the services of a trained attendant bear this in mind and show the maid that you do bear it in mind work after hours it is a more difficult matter to get the servant to look at the subject from this standpoint she has not been educated to regard things from both sides it is the custom of her cult to meet and in conclave assembled to compare the faults foibles and failings of their employers and when they do commend an employer for kind treatment it is as a rule only to make the lot of another servant look darker by contrast with the bright one depicted oh me dear exclaims bridget on entering nora's kitchen at eight thirty in the evening and finding her still washing dishes and is this the hour that a poor hard-working girl is kept up to wash the dinner things there is no such doin's in my kitchen i tell ye my lady knows that i ain't made of iron and she knows too that i would not put up with such an imposition the fact that nora's mistress has helped her all day with the work that she is herself the victim of unexpected company that she regrets as much as nora that the unavoidable detention at the office of the master of the house has made dinner later than usual does not deter the suddenly enlightened girl from feeling herself a martyr and the seed of hate and distrust is quick to bear fruit in an offensive manner and a sulky style of speech she does not pause to take into consideration that while she may just now be doing extra work 
she also receives daily extra kindnesses and consideration that were not agreed upon in the contract of her hire two ways of doing there are just two rules that make the relations of mistress and maid tolerable or pleasant one is that everything be put on a purely business basis an arrangement hardly practical in domestic labor the other rule and the better is that a little practical christianity be brought into the relationship that the maid do her best cheerfully and willingly and that the mistress treat her in the same spirit giving her little pleasures when it is within her power to do so trying to smooth the rough places and to make crooked things straight then let each respect the other and make the best of the situation if it is intolerable it may be changed if not intolerable let each remember that there is no law human or divine that demands that the contract stand for ever and let each dissolve the partnership when she wishes to do so until this is done mistress and maid should keep silence as to the faults of the other trying to see rather the virtues than the failings of a sister woman i wish that some word of mine with regard to this matter could sink into the mind of the mistress i fear that it will never be possible to train the maid not to talk of her mistress to her friends but the employer should be above discussing her servants with outsiders this is one of the most glaring faults of conversation one of the most flagrant breaches of conversational etiquette among women of refinement the hackneyed warning that the three d's to be banished from polite conversation are dress disease and domestics has not been heeded by the average housewife so far as the last d is concerned she will fill willing and unwilling ears with the account of her servants impertinences of their faults of how they are leaving without giving warning and of how ungrateful all servants are until one would think that her own soul was not above that of the laundress chambermaid and cook whose failings she dissects in public such talk reminds one of the conversation with which bridget regales an admiring and indignant couture with the uneducated hireling it may be pardonable in the case of the educated employer it is inexcusable the best trained servants say yes madam instead of yes ma'am in england women as well as men servants are addressed by their surnames the custom does not commend itself to our american ideas women with one maid caps and apron women who keep only one maid should if possible have the laundry work done out of the house only so can one be sure of a trim-looking servant to answer the door and the appearance of the person who admits us to a house is taken very justly as a criterion of the domestic standards of the house a popular novelist once divided the houses in a certain city into three classes those that had maids those that had maids without caps and those who had maids with caps a woman's social standing need not depend on her having a maid at all she may quite come to her own door as one snobbish woman puts it but if she keep a maid the maid should be properly dressed and the cap is as essential a part of her dress as her apron end of section thirty seven section thirty eight of marion harland's complete etiquette this is a LibriVox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen marian harland's complete etiquette by marian harland the woman without a maid the thought of being without a maid strikes dismay to the heart of many a woman who cannot be accused of laziness she thinks of the manual toil connected with housekeeping as composed of a round of degrading tasks and she cannot imagine herself as performing these with dignity and attractiveness the ugliness connected with doing bridget's work is what repels and it must be confessed at the start that dust and dishwater are not agreeable things to contemplate though hemmed squares of clean cheesecloth for the one and plenty of good soap in the other tend to reduce disagreeable qualities to a minimum one half at least of the prejudice many women not financially prosperous 
feel against doing their own work as the phrase curiously goes is the aversion of doing unbeautiful things the other half rises from the sense of dismay in attempting that in which one has had no practice for which one has had no previous preparation the tasks connected with housekeeping are many and various and if one is called to face them without experience or a system the result is apt to be pandemonium until the mistress maid is broken in it is a pity however to approach the work with the idea that it is necessarily distasteful and disagreeable most women have some natural aptitude for domestic service when properly trained they like it or at least parts of it what they lack often is not aptitude but practice and instead of expecting to gain skill through practice as they would in other departments of work they expect it to come by inspiration housekeeping is a science and an art more even than this it is a business and needs exactly as the business of a man does time and patience for its conquest dressing for work a sub-professor on a small salary in one of our best eastern educational institutions married a charming young woman with a wise head on her pretty shoulders her thought was that she could best help him by doing the work of a maid her name wherever known had been a synonym for exquisite taste and she lost nothing of this in the conduct of her new role ugliness of any sort was not in her scheme of things she determined that she should be no less pretty in her husband's eyes because of the part she was to play in his kitchen she had made for herself eight blue and white striped seersucker gowns with broad hems on the short skirts and with plain shirt waists the sleeves were made elbow length so as not to incommode her in her work and a turnover collar of white which left her throat free was at once comfortable and becoming with these dresses she wore dark aprons or white ones according to the work she was doing her husband and friends declared she had never looked more pleasing than while in service she was an excellent refutation of the idea that a woman must look slovenly when doing household tasks though dressing the part seems a small beginning toward getting the work of a house done it is a helpful beginning because it affects the spirits a working woman needs working clothes if they are pretty as well as comfortable and appropriate they give an impetus toward cheerful labor that is not to be lightly estimated avoid interruptions the value of system a woman who learns to be her own maid and makes a success of the work must adopt it as a business and must devote herself to her tasks with regularity and system she must be firm against intrusion and interruption from the outside world she must adopt housekeeping as a profession and aim not merely at completing the daily round but at achieving an excellence that will in time impart interest to the work order and simplicity are the two laws she must obey if she is to get through with dignity and self-respect an order of the day and an order of the week must be made out and followed as far as possible system and arrangement are the great time savers to sit down at one's desk once a day or once a week and make out conscientiously a list of all the things necessary to be done in the time named then divide and tabulate these according as seems best this use of the brain will economize time and will save many a weary step orderliness in work leads most directly to that harmony and peace in housekeeping which the average woman is so fearful of losing when she takes up the labor for herself the writer used frequently to take luncheon at the house of a clever friend who cooked and served the meals her cooking could always be counted on as delicious but it was the serving that scylla and charybdis in one of most women who must do entirely for themselves that astonished and delighted one on a side table ready for her hand were placed the extra dishes needed on this too was room for those things only temporarily necessary on the dining-table 
the occasions when the hostess must rise to serve her guests were reduced by the perfection of her arrangements to a minimum when she was compelled to visit pantry or kitchen she left the table without a flurry and was back with the article in question almost before one realized her departure this grace in service was partly of course a matter of nature but it was largely due to trained and systematic habits of work these oiled the wheels of housekeeping and made them run more or less smoothly a simple menu the woman without a maid must cultivate simplicity as well as order in her household arrangements to do this requires some originality of soul and mind she must model her work not upon what her neighbors and friends do but upon what she thinks necessary to be done for the comfort and good health of herself and those dependent upon her she must not attempt more things than she can do well many a young woman who starts out with joyous intention to be cook for husband and family fails in her intention by reason of planning too large a bill of fare for beginners at least it is well to cut out made desserts and pretentious salads a cream soup with a broiled steak potatoes nicely cooked lettuce with a french dressing coffee and fruit make a dinner which if neatly served affords nourishment and delight to the ordinary man how much better to attempt nothing more than this and make a success of it than to try for roast two or three vegetables an intricate salad and a pudding to have these imperfectly achieved and awkwardly served for it goes without saying that it is much more difficult to serve an elaborate than a simple meal also the elaborate meal demands for serving many more dishes and the extra dishes make added work in the dishwashing which follows a meal as the night the day simplicity of living must be the aim of the woman who does her own work it is only by cultivating simplicity that she can live restfully and with the taste that makes for beauty dividing household tasks in a household where no servant is employed each member of the family should regularly perform certain duties where there is a family of some size all the work should not be crowded upon the shoulders of the mistress if one person does the dusting another the mending another the cooking another the sweeping and so on through the list of necessary employment in a household the burden need not fall too heavily upon any one no paid servant can feel the interest in successful achievement that rewards the effort of those who are laboring for the convenience and beauty of their own home a household conducted on plans of the most rigid economy may still be cheerful and even charming if the member of it choose to view the matter in a sort of bohemian picnicking spirit if the duties are assigned with regard to the tastes and capacities of each no real hardship is involved and a spirit of gaiety is invoked by the concerted effort at producing comfort with the expenditure of little money the vulgarity of pretense an utter absence of pretense is the only graceful attitude in a home conducted in the way described to be ashamed of the work one does and to try to conceal it results in an uneasy hypocritical manner and deceives no one i almost opened my own door when she called on me said a silly snobbish impecunious woman in telling of the visit paid by a rich resident of the neighbourhood the remark blinded no one and made the speaker ridiculous there are books of various kinds written for the help of the woman who must get on without a maid these often can make for a quicker and better path to her goal than she can work out alone and unaided one of the best-known stories about the great english statesman charles james fox is of his learning to carve he determined to make a conquest of this branch of knowledge as he did of any other attempted by him day after day he brought to the dining-table with him a book on carving and cut the fowl or joint placed before him in accordance with the rules of the book his subsequent beautiful carving was the result of this method of his willingness to learn the best way of doing whatever he attempted help from cook-books reliable books on cooking on the relative values of foods on sanitary housekeeping are not hard to find while the magazines and papers are full of happy suggestions on these and kindred themes 
a woman who intends to be her own maid should possess some reliable volumes on her subject should make her work more interesting to herself and more valuable to her family by a reference to authorities on her subject the more one knows about the work one has in hand the more one is apt to care for it and enthusiasm for one's task in its turn begets good work no woman on whom falls the burden of keeping her own house should feel permanently discouraged she may learn to do her task not only with comfort but with grace the difficulties in her way can be surmounted through experience and study if she has a natural liking for the ordering and managing of a house her work may become a delight why do you look so sad said one woman to another because i have a perfect maid said the second all my life until recently i kept house for my husband and myself housekeeping was my passion as music is yours now my husband insists that i keep a maid she knows her business it would spoil her if i helped i am a stranger in my own kitchen wouldn't you be unhappy if you had no opportunity to play chopin and beethoven well i am miserable because i can't concoct salads and soups this testimony to the joys of housekeeping is extreme but it may serve to cheer some beginner in domestic labor who sees only duty but no pleasure in the work a southern girl's party to feel that because one is limited in means one cannot entertain is wholly mistaken the young lady in a southern family in aristocrat charleston herself the granddaughter of a governor of the state and a member of the famous st cecilia society told the writer who was a paying guest in the simple home how she entertained her friends in the morning we whip up a cake order cream telephone the girls and when they come that's the party but her own delightful spirit of hospitality the perfection of her breeding were the largest element in that party's undoubted success End of section 38section thirty nine of marion harland's complete etiquette this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b marion harland's complete etiquette by marion harland woman in business relations the number of women who enter into business life and the number of avenues open to them for earning a living are constantly increasing and however much we may be disposed to ridicule the agitation concerning woman's progress and the rights of woman no fair-minded person can fail to recognize the happy changes such agitation in the last decade has wrought in the attitude of the world toward women who make their own way in it the old-fashioned prejudice of gentility against a woman employing her powers to make money has very largely disappeared many a delicate-minded woman of the old school has lived in poverty or has incurred unwillingly financial obligations to family connections because of the prejudice against her doing something for herself because of the feeling that her social position a matter naturally of high importance to a woman would be injured by her stepping out of the family niche and picking up something for herself on the highway open to all she feared more even than this perhaps the loss of those particularly feminine attributes and charms so dear to every real woman's heart in the old-fashioned conception of a woman who worked outside of her own home it used to be taken for granted that she must be denied social consideration and must give up her share of fun in the world all this is now a matter of history and is recalled only for the purpose of showing the contrast between her former outlook and her present one except in a few ultra fashionable communities in the united states the social position of a woman in business is not affected unhappily by her work provided she has the qualities requisite for social recognition and consideration her business is no detriment she has the same general opportunities for social recreation that offer themselves to a man of business and it often happens that her work gives a zest to the enjoyment of such opportunities 
unknown to women of idler habits the writer has in mind as an example an engaging young woman who serves most acceptably as an attendant in the public library of a western city her duties keep her from nine in the morning till six in the evening but they have not in the least obscured her charmingly agreeable personal quality she is much in demand the number of her masculine admirers is large enough to excite the envy of many a girl whose father's bank account is a large one the attention she gives to her work seems to impart an added vivacity to her playtime notwithstanding the fact however that a woman may enjoy the leisure she has for social demands as much after entering business life as before she must not carry the little graces and amenities of society into business life business is business with a woman as well as a man and the woman who succeeds in the calling she has chosen is the one who does not attempt to mix its details with matters of a more recreative nature she must not expect to win favors by any but the straightforward method of doing her work well the prejudice which so long existed among men against women in business relations was partly caused by the thought that they could never forget that they were women could never discuss work or business relations on impersonal and rational grounds the first lesson a woman must learn in making her own way financially is to appreciate the fact that the office the shop whatever be her place of employment is no place for superfluous courtesies the cultivation of a cool matter-of-fact unsentimental way of looking at the work in hand is the only path to honorable achievement what a woman wears cheap moralist to the contrary is always important it is especially important in business relations because the impression she creates is to a considerable degree dependent upon it the self-supporting woman when about her work should not dress elaborately or conspicuously bright colors jewels extreme hats should be rigidly barred from her wardrobe she should be dressed quietly but becomingly with exquisite neatness and to a reasonable extent in the prevailing mode a quiet elegance in style care in the manner of putting on her clothes these go a long way toward creating the proper appearance for the woman in business human nature being as it is the properly gowned woman of business has a far better chance than the one who is dowdily dressed the habit of many young girls in the business world of wearing sleeves that do not come to the elbow and displaying an amount of chest that would be proper only at an evening party is a serious mistake another mistake is the marked preference for wearing even in winter time white shirt waists if these waists are to be really fresh and fit for wear a new one must be put on every day and that is an expense that the wearers clearly cannot afford dark dresses with touches of white at neck and wrists are a much wiser choice when one must economize it is very commonly said that men have larger interests than women and that one reason for this lies in the fact that in their everyday work they form naturally and easily relations with many people whereas a woman's relations with the world too often come through the more artificial channels of pleasure a woman in business has the same opportunity for meeting people on real ground that a man has she should take advantage of these openings to healthful communication with her kind we have all come in contact with women who have been thus broadened and have realized in them a kind of attraction not to be found in women leading more secluded lives it is well in summing up the pros and cons of the business woman's life to lay stress on her advantages and the one just named is one of which she should make the most women as a class are sometimes accused of a lack of method in the performance of their tasks this is owing to the fact that the duties of domestic life may often be performed at any hour the housekeeper chooses and that attention to them is not rigidly fixed as to time a business career is often an effectual remedy for desultory habits and this is the reason that many women who have served a time as wage earners come back to housekeeping with renewed energy and ability the best housekeepers the writer has ever known were retired women of business 
they put into the tasks of the home the method the promptness they learned in a more exacting field however women who are engaged the greater part of the day in offices libraries in shops should not be expected to engage to any large degree in household duties it sometimes happens that the members of a family circle in which one woman goes out to earn her bread and butter have little consideration for her tired state of mind and body when she leaves her work and returns to her home they expect of her a double duty and this is manifestly unfair it is most important that a business woman have rest or diversion in her spare time so that she will not get into a rut so that she may do justice to her work her family should not forget that her money-making powers will be crippled by forced attention to other duties men are treated far more considerately in this regard than women nothing is allowed to interfere with the average business man's arrangements to facilitate these everything possible is done by his family this may be because men are more insistent because they have a way of demanding their rights it would be well for women in business well also for their families that they should look sharp and pursue the same policy end of section thirty nine section number forty of marion harlan's complete etiquette this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c marion harlan's complete etiquette by marion harlan a financial study for our young couple thirty years ago i held a heart-to-heart -heart talk with reasonable well-meaning husbands on the vital subject of the monetary relations between man and wife i quote a paragraph the force of which has been confirmed to my mind by the additional experience and observation of three more decades than were set to my credit upon the age roll when i penned the words i have studied this matter long and seriously and i offer you as the result of my observation in various walks of life and careful calculation of labor and expense the bold assertion that every wife who performs her part even tolerably well in whatsoever rank of society more than earns her living and that this should be an acknowledged fact with both parties to the marriage contract the idea of her dependence upon her husband is essentially false and mischievous and should be done away with at once and forever it has crushed self-respect out of thousands of women it has scourged thousands from the marriage altar to the tomb with a whip of scorpions it has driven many to desperation and crime i have headed this chapter a financial study for our young married couple because i have little hope of changing the opinions and customs of the mature benedict our youthful wedded pair should come to a rational mutual understanding in the first week of housekeeping as to an equitable division of the income on which they are to live together if you our generic john shrink from coming down to cold business before the echoes of the wedding bells have died in ear and in heart call the discussion a matter of marriage etiquette and approach it confidently and do you mrs john meet his overtures in a straightforward sensible way with no foolish shrinking from the idea of even apparent independence of him to whom you have entrusted your person and your happiness it is of course your part to hearken quietly to whatever proposition your more business-like spouse may make as to the just partition not of his means 
which are likewise yours but of the sums you are respectively to handle and to spend do not accept what he apportions for your use as a benefaction he has endowed you with all his worldly goods and the law confirms the endowment to a certain extent you are a co-proprietor not a pensioner if while the glamour of love's young dream envelops and dazes you you are chilled by what seems sordid and commonplace take the word of an old campaigner for it that the time will come when your allowance will be a factor in happiness as well as in comfort may i quote to john another and longer extract from the thirty-year-old talk concerning allowances set aside from your income what you adjudge to be a reasonable and liberal sum for the maintenance of your household in the style suitable for people of your means and position determine what purchases you will yourself make and what shall be entrusted to your wife and put the money needed for her proportion into her care as frankly as you take charge of your share try the experiment of talking to her as if she were a business partner let her understand what you can afford to do and what you cannot if in this explanation you can say we and ours you will gain a decided moral advantage although it may be at the cost of masculine prejudice and pride of power impress upon her mind that a certain sum made over to her apart from the rest is hers absolutely not a present from you but her honest earnings and that you would not be honest were you to withhold it and do not ask her if that will do any more than you would address the question to any other woman with what cordial detestation wives regard that brief query which drops like a sentence of the creed from husbandly lips i leave your spouse to tell you also if she ever heard of a woman who answered anything but yes carrying out the idea of co-partnership should your wife exceed her allowance running herself and consequently you into debt meet the exigency as you would a similar indiscretion on the part of a young and inexperienced member of your firm treat the extravagance as a mistake not a fault not one girl wife in one hundred who has not been a wage earner has had any experience in the management of finances the father gives the daughter money when she or her mother tells him that she needs it or would like to have it when it is gone he is applied to for some more she has been a beneficiary all her life usually an irresponsible thoughtless recipient of what is lavished or doled out to her according to the parental whim and means teach her business methods tactfully yet decidedly one young wife i wot of began keeping the expense book presented to her by her husband with these entries january fourth received seventy five dollars january sixth spent seventy dollars twenty five cents shopping etc balance four dollars and seventy five cents set down to profit and loss after fifteen years of married life her husband died bequeathing the whole of a large estate to her and making her sole guardian of their three children a confidence fully justified by her conduct of the affairs thus committed to her my husband trained me patiently and thoroughly she said to one who complimented her financial sagacity i was an ignominious when we were married 
then laughingly she related the profit and loss incident it is the fashion to sneer at women's business methods who are to blame for their blunders should your wife play with her allowance as a child with a new toy let censure fall upon those who have kept her in leading strings teach her gradually to comprehend her responsibilities the sense of them will steady her unless she be exceptionally feather-brained be she wasteful or frugal the allowance you have made to her is as honestly hers to have to hold or to spend as the third of your estate which the law will give her in the event of your death settlements according to the english sense of the word are not yet common in the united states one american father whose daughter was on the eve of marriage with an englishman ordered the prospective bridegroom out of the house when the foreigner queried innocently as to the settlements the future father-in-law intended to make upon his child a man with a reputation for fortune hunting had nearly rid himself of the slur by insisting that his fiancée's large estate should be settled absolutely upon herself her quandrum guardian put a different complexion on the generous act by divulging the circumstance that the husband by the same settlement had made himself sole trustee of his wife's property of every description while there are perhaps fewer purely mercenary marriages in our country than in any other it cannot be denied that a large proportion of enterprising young men act consciously or unwittingly on the advice of the scotchman who warned his son not to marry for money but in seeking a wife to gay where money is is he marrying her fortune or herself asked one gossip of another when approaching bridal was spoken of they say he is very much in love with her was the answer uttered dubiously i fancy however that he would have repressed his passion if she were a poor girl which brings us to much more delicate matter than the division of the income earned or inherited by the bridegroom it is a fact that may have much significance or none that the bride makes no mention of endowing her husband with all or any portion of her worldly goods it is likewise significant that laws of man's devising take it for granted that her property goes with her so that in most of our states it is his without other act of gift than the marriage ceremony the man who marries for money has no scruples as to the acceptance and use of it sometimes it is squandered sometimes but not often it is hoarded most frequently it goes into the husband's business and is invested by him for the benefit of himself and his family the nicer issue with which we have to do is how our conscientious john who would have married his best girl if she had not possessed one penny in her own right is to comport himself with regard to the fortune modest or considerable which she brings to him as dowry briefly and clearly as a trust not to be committed to the chances and changes of his individual ventures no investment should be made of his wife's money without her knowledge and full consent in all that he does where her funds are involved he should be her actuary and what profits result from operations with her funds should be settled on herself and children by this course alone can he retain his self-respect 
his reputation as an honorable man and certainly disabuse his wife's mind of any possible suspicion that his affection was not wholly for her end of section 40 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc section 41 of marion harlan's complete etiquette this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc marion harlan's complete etiquette by marion harland more talk about allowances the arrangement between husband and wife concerning money matters should be no more definite and businesslike than that subsisting between father and children to be taught early the real value of money is a distinct assistance to financial integrity in later life to have in one's possession even as a child a sum wholly one's own conduces to a feeling of self-respect and independence as soon as a child is old enough to know what money is and that for money things are bought and sold he should have an allowance be it only a penny a week suggestions but not commands as to its expenditure should accompany the gift gradually the weekly or monthly amount should be increased and instructions should be given as to its possible use a child may be advised properly to divide his small funds between pleasure and charity or between the things bought solely for his own benefit and those for the benefit of others the value of the expenditure in each case being dependent on the freedom of his choice as he grows older he should be taught to expend money for necessities he should be trained to buy his own clothes and other personal belongings this sort of training often disastrously neglected is of far more practical value than many things taught in the schools the feeling of responsibility engendered in children or young people by trusting them with a definite amount of money for certain general purposes can scarcely fail of a happy result it binds them to a performance of duty while it confers at the same time a delicious sense of freedom an allowance for necessities gives its recipient liberty of choice in expenditure but the choice must be judicious or the recipient suffers this it does not take him long to find out many a man who refuses his sons and daughters allowances permits them to run up large bills at the various shops where they trade exactly what the amount of these bills will be he never knows except that it is sure to be larger than he wishes the children of such a man never have any ready money they do not know what to count on and in consequence not being trusted they exercise all their ingenuity to outwit the head of the family and to trick from him exactly as much money as possible a young woman with somewhat extravagant tendencies who belonged to the class of the unallowanced begged her father for a new gown she pleaded and pleaded in vain finally he said if she had anything that could be made over he would stand for the bill this word to the wise was sufficient she took the waistband of an old gown to her modiste who built upon it a beautiful frock for which the likewise sent in a beautiful bill fortunately the daughter had a father who was a connoisseur in wit 
and who would appreciate a joke even at his own expense but the example will serve as well as another to illustrate the lengths to which a woman may resort when not treated as a reasonable and reasoning creature about money matters i would rather have one half the amount of money of which i might otherwise have the use and have it in the form of an allowance said a young woman who was discussing with other young women the subject of expenditures if i know what i am to have i can spend it to much better advantage i can exercise some method in my purchases if i don't know i am likely to spend a large sum on some two or three articles with the hope that more is coming suddenly and unexpectedly father sets his foot down on further bills and there i am with a dream of a hat but no shoes or with a ball gown and not a coat to my back money plays some part in the life of every human being belonging to a civilized nation the question of successful and skillful expenditure is a vital question for the majority of people it is not a question that can be solved without training yet we educate children in various unimportant matters and for the most part leave this of money untouched in no way can a child or young person be taught so readily and so quickly the proper use of money as by limiting his expenses to a certain sum which sum he nevertheless controls End of section 41. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section 42 of Marion Harlan's Complete Etiquette. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Marion Harland's Complete Etiquette by Marion Harland A Few of the Little Things That Are Big Things Seeing the prevalence of rudeness in human intercourse, one is forced to believe that the natural man is a cross-grained brute that breeding and culture often convert him into a creature of gentleness and refinement speaks volumes for the powers of such influence the average man seems to take a savage delight in occasionally giving vent to brutal or cutting speech to yield thus to a primal and savage instinct is to prove that breeding and refinement are lacking there are certain business men who during business hours meet one with a brusque manner that would not be pardoned in a petty tradesman if we visit them on their own business not as intruders it is the same they seem to feel that a certain disagreeable humor is an indispensable accompaniment to the occasion such insolence is usually taken as a matter of course by the recipient who immediately feels penitent at the thought of his intrusion too often the physician who is not a gentleman at heart trades on the fact that his patients regard him as a necessity and is as disagreeable as his temper at the moment demands that he shall be he intimates that he is so busy that he has scarcely time to give his advice that the person he attends had no business to get ill and in fact makes himself generally so disagreeable it is to be wondered at that the sufferer ever calls in this man again yet in a drawing-room and talking to a well person this man's manner would be charming 
one sometimes feels that sick people and physicians might well be classed as patients and impatients it is but fair to remark that to the credit of physicians it is not always those who have had the largest experience or who stand at the head of their profession who deserve to come under the above condemnation the men to whom the world looks for advice in the matters of which they have made a study and who are sure of their standing are often the gentlest the most courteous counting room courtesy our busy men have need to remember that the man who is gentle at heart shows that gentleness in counting room and office as well as in drawing room and dining room and the fact that the person calling on him for business purposes or advice is a woman should compel him to show the politeness which is to do and say the kindest thing in the kindest way on the other hand common courtesy and consideration for another demand that the person who intrudes on a man when he is busy should state his business briefly and then take his departure only the busy man or woman knows the agony that comes with the knowledge that the precious moments of the working hours are being frittered away on that which is unnecessary when necessary work is standing by begging for the attention it deserves and should receive let him who would be careful on points of etiquette remember that there is an etiquette of working hours as well as the hours of leisure and sociability asking questions perhaps a lapse from good breeding most common in general society is the asking of questions one is aghast at the evidence of impertinent curiosity that parades under the guise of friendly interest interrogations as to the amount of one's income occupation and even as to one's age and general condition are legion and inexcusable every one who writes be he a well-known author or a penny a-liner knows only too well the query what are you writing now and knows too the feeling of impotent rage awakened by this query yet unless one would be as rude as one's questioner one must smile inanely and make an evasive answer to ask no question does not of necessity mean a lack of interest in the person with whom one is conversing a polite and sympathetic attention will show a more genuine and appreciative interest than much inquisitiveness a lack of interest in what is being told one is a breach of courtesy that is all too common often one sees a man or woman deliberately pick up a book or paper open it and glance over it while his interlocutor is in the midst of a story he means to make interesting if the conversation is interesting it deserves the undivided attention of both persons if what is being said is not worth attention the listener should at least respect the speaker's intention to please there is nothing more dampening to conversational enthusiasm or more squelching to eloquence than to find the eyes of the person with whom one is talking fixed on a book or magazine which he declares he is simply looking over or at whose pictures he is only glancing the good listener a good listener is in himself an inspiration even if one is not attracted by the person to whom one is talking one should assume interest this rule also holds good with regard to the attention given to a public speaker in listening to a preacher or to a lecturer one should look at him steadily not allowing the eyes to wander about the building and along the ceiling and walls 
this habit of a seemingly fixed attention is easily cultivated if one is really interested in the address it aids in the enjoyment and comprehension of it to watch the speaker's facial play and gestures if one is bored one may yet fix the eyes upon the face of the person to whom one is supposed to be listening and continue to think one's own thoughts and to plan one's own plans and certainly the person who is exerting himself for the entertainment of his audience will speak better and be more comfortable for the knowledge that eyes belonging to some one who is apparently absorbed in his address are fixed upon him tactful criticism one of the difficult things to do is to pass a criticism or make a suggestion as to the speech or manner of another person yet there are times when to refrain is to do the greatest unkindness to a person sincerely eager to learn a happy solution is to include one's self if possible in the censor given i'm afraid we i'm afraid we were all a little boisterous tonight," said a tactful woman of the world to a young girl who really had been boisterous she caught the criticism intended yet felt no hurt at the speaker talking at the telephone conditions under which otherwise polite persons feel that they can be rude are those attendant on a telephone conversation with the first word many a man drops his courtesy as if it were a garment that did not fit him and women do the same if central were to record all that she it seems to be usually a she hears and all that is said to her our ears would tingle true it is that she sometimes is surely pert and ill-mannered but if she is ill-bred that is no reason for the person talking to follow suit were one really amiable to arrest for profanity over the wires the police would be kept busy if they performed their duty but putting aside the underbred who swears let us listen for a moment to the so-called courteous person for he is courteous under ordinary circumstances scolding central hello central how long are you going to keep me waiting i told you i wanted thirty forty spring yes i did say that and if you would pay attention to your business you would know it i never saw such a worthless set as they have at the central office got them did you it's time hello thirty forty is that you well why the devil didn't you send that stuff around this morning going to right away are you well it's time you did what ails you people anyway no central i'm not through and i wish to heaven you'd let this line alone while i'm talking and so on ad infinitum is all this worth while and is it necessary and must women who as they call themselves ladies do not give vent to express profanity so far copy the manners of the so-called stronger sex that they scream like shrews over the telephone calling one day on a woman whom i had met with pleasure half a dozen times i was the unwilling listener to her conversation with her grocer she began by rating central for not asking what number as soon as the receiver was lifted from the hook having warmed up to business on this unseen girl she got still more heated with the grocer at the other end of the wire she had ordered one kind of apples and he had sent her another and the slip of paper containing the list of her purchases had an item of five cent box of matches that she had not ordered with regard to all of which she expolated shrilly 
and with numerous exclamations that were as near as she dared to come to masculine explosives such as great heavens goodness gracious and so forth after threatening to transfer her custom to another grocer and refusing to accept the apology of the abject tradesman she compromised by saying that she would give him another trial and hung up the receiver coming into the parlor and beginning a conversation once more in the even society voice i had invariably heard before from her courtesy pays that the ways of telephones and the persons who operate them are sometimes trying no one can deny least of all the writer of this chapter who lives in a house with one of those maddening essentials to human comfort but the loss of temper that manifests itself in the outward speech is not a requisite of the proper appreciation and use of the telephone it is nothing less than a habit and a pernicious one this way we have of talking into the transmitter let us remember that courtesy pays better than curses and politeness better than profanity if not then let us have poor service from central and preserve our self-respect never speak of calling a friend on the phone the abbreviation is vulgar though one sometimes hears it on the lips of delightful people but one should not make the mistake of justifying a solecism by saying mrs so and so says it to study the graces and avoid the blunders of other people should be the aim of those who aspire to be well bred in market and shop the breeding of women is often shown by the manner she uses when shopping or marketing courtesy to clerks to tradesmen of every sort is the mark of a lady the word used in that beautiful old-fashioned sense to which alas we have grown a little callous when a customer has the right measurably to see what a shop affords before she makes a choice she has no right to give a clerk the trouble of taking out everything when she has no intention of buying if she gives much trouble before her decision as to a purchase is reached she should thank the clerk in charge for his extra labor the fact that he is paid for his time does not make this duty the less altercations with clerks and other subordinates in a shop are in exorable taste and often a sign of a hysterical as well as a chloratic temper if women should be considerate in their manner towards employees of the shops where they trade it is quite as true that clerks should be trained to civility by their employers for instance a part of the duty of clerks is of course to keep watch over the articles sold to do this it is not necessary however to watch the customer as if she were a prospective thief this attitude on the part of the clerk is not pleasant for the customer and does not encourage trade unwise endearments the suspicious attitude is however no worse than the familiar one employed by some of the young women serving in shops a clerk who urges a customer to buy because the article in question has proved so satisfactory in her own family or the young woman who calls one dearie or honey as she fits a cloak upon one or manipulates one's millinery makes a mistake the relation between clerk and customer should always be formal and courteous on both sides marketing is a branch of shopping in which many women not fundamentally ill-natured have the appearance of being so there is a kind of ugly scrutiny which many women apply to the inspection of vegetables meat and other edibles that is most unattractive 
if these women had an idea of the way they look when they bend their hard cold eyes upon the innocent vegetables and fruits they would at any cost cultivate a more agreeable manner beware of the marketing stare as for a string bag if you have one put it in the furnace a rudeness of which people who should know better are frequently guilty is that of criticizing a dear friend of the person to whom one is talking this is not only ill-mannered but unkind and one of many flagrant violations of the golden rule if a man loves his friend do not call his attention to that friend's failings or twit him on his fondness for such a person he is happier for not seeing the failings and if the friendship brings him any happiness or makes life even a little pleasanter for him do not be guilty of the cruelty of clouding that happiness if the man does see the faults of him he loves and loyally ignores him pretend that you are not aware of the foibles toward which he would have you believe him blind the knowledge of the peccadilloes of those in whom we trust comes only too soon we need not hurry on the always disappointing often bitter knowledge never patronize perhaps lack of breeding shows in nothing more than in the manner of receiving an invitation should a man say patronizingly oh perhaps i can arrange to come when you invite him to some function write him down as unworthy of another invitation he is lacking in respect to you and in appreciation of the honor you confer on him in asking him to partake of the hospitality you have devised really protests one man plaintively i am very tired i have been out every night for two weeks and now you want me for to-morrow night i am doubtful whether i ought to come i am so weary that i feel i need rest the stately woman who had asked him to her house smiled amusedly pray let me settle your doubts for you she said and urge you not to neglect the rest nature demands your first duty is to her not to me the man was too obtuse or too conceited to perceive the veiled sarcasm and to know that the invitation was withdrawn acknowledging favors unless one receives special permission from the person giving an invitation to hold the matter open for some good and sufficient reason one should accept or decline a verbal invitation as soon as it is given if circumstances make this impossible one should apologize for hesitating saying i'm so anxious to come that i'm going to ask your permission to send you my answer later after i ascertain if my husband has no engagement for that evening or some such form the hostess will readily grant such a request it may seem far-fetched to speak of ingratitude as a breach of etiquette but the lack of acknowledgment of favors is very much like it the man who accepts all done for him as his due who forgets the thank you in return for the trifling favors is not a gentleman in that respect at least the young men and young women of to-day are too often spoiled or heedless taking pretty attentions offered them as matters of course and as their right in this miscellaneous chapter it may be well to enforce what is said elsewhere with regard to the respect every man should show to women for instance every man who really respects the women of his family will remove his hat when he enters the house there are however men who kiss these same women with covered heads 
in a well-known play acted by a traveling company some years ago in a small town the hero standing in a garden told the heroine he loved her was accepted by her and bent to kiss her without removing the controversial derby from his blonde pat all sentiment was destroyed for the spectators when irate hibernian accents sounded forth from the gallery with suppose ye take off your hat ye ill-mannered blokey the irishman was in the right a word to the shy i would say a word to those who through bashfulness or self-consciousness do the things they ought not to do and leave undone those things which they ought to do they are so uncomfortable in society so afraid of not appearing as they should and so much absorbed in wondering how they look and act and wishing that they did better that they are guilty of the very acts of omission and commission they would guard against if i could give one rule to the bashful it would be forget yourself and your affairs in interest in others and their affairs be so fully occupied noticing how well others appear and trying to make everybody about you comfortable that you have no time to think of your behavior you will then not be guilty of any flagrant breach of etiquette the most courteous women i have ever known those whose manners were a charm to all whom they met were those who were self-forgetful and always watching for opportunities to make other people comfortable such are the queens of society undue self-criticism if you do make a mistake take consolation from the fact which will be apparent to you in time that others do the same perfect good breeding is a state to which few obtain absolutely one should not make oneself thoroughly unhappy by too constant self-criticism for to do this is to disobey paradoxically a fundamental societal law the old negro who when asked to describe what he meant by quality folks expressed this law when he answered quality never doubts their selves the beginner must doubt but he should not agonize about it talking shop talking shop is usually alluded to as a decided breach of etiquette in many cases it is so yet there are people who are never so entertaining as when doing this very thing and there are companies in which it is entirely proper they should do it one must use discretion certainly no one should be forced to talk of his daily work if he evidently prefers not to do so physicians in particular should not be compelled to play the professional when they are trying to relax socially a party is not the place for propaganda the hostess who may be an ardent advocate of votes for women should be sure that all her guests share her views before she dogmatically propounds them she may indeed politely introduce the topic and if she merely does this no one present has a right to take offence or should hesitate in the same spirit to speak of her own view but the subject is likely to prove dangerous the writer has seen charming women utterly lose control of themselves and all but maul one another over a discussion on equal suffrage a social mistake to be avoided is that of being touchy to be so occasions one great unhappiness and leads to serious mistakes in conduct do not allow yourself to find slights or affronts in the demeanor of those with whom you are thrown unless there is real foundation for the feeling 
the mental attitude of fancying that others intend to wound us grows if it is indulged in and finally leaves us hopelessly out of key cordial greetings one of the most valuable of social acquisitions is the habit of greeting people in a delightful way learn to say good morning audibly heartily as if you mean it unless one means to be very informal one should add the name good morning mrs smith we all know men and women who possess this grace of salutation which lingers happily on those on whom it is bestowed in meeting people for the first time one should take pains to get their names exactly right there is something very personal in one's feeling about one's name and one has a right to have it spoken and written as one elects if a man is named davies he cannot be blamed for resenting it if people indifferently address him as mr davis if people who make introductions would take more trouble to speak the name distinctly this would help greatly if the name is indistinctly uttered you may say pardon me i did not understand the name which will generally bring forth a clear repetition small matters such as quiet breathing betoken gentlehood flowers if one is inhaling their perfume should be treated delicately the face should not be buried in them remember browning's word any nose may ravage with impunity a rose it is frequently said that the weather as a topic of conversation is tabooed but how charmingly chesterton has defended it there are very deep reasons for talking about the weather it is a gesture of primal worship to begin with the weather is a pagan way of beginning with prayer then it is an expression of that elementary idea in politeness equality in that we all have our hats under the dark blue spangled umbrella of the universe surely after reading so fine a plea no one need fear to begin the morning's conversation with a word on the weather getting off a street car one of the things that most women need to learn is the correct way of getting off a street car which is to step off with the right foot facing front which saves awkwardness in every case and sometimes if the car starts too soon an accident nothing more absolutely marks a lady than her manner toward her social inferior she is kindly but never patronizing a woman who was once being fitted for new shoes and who had inquired of the clerk who waited on her how his family were the man had been at his post for many years and she called him by name turned to a woman acquaintance who was waiting her turn and said explanatorily i always speak to the butcher the baker and the candlestick maker if this was her custom why apologize for it at the hotel table when strangers are served at the same table in a hotel they should bow and say good morning or good evening on sitting down and on leaving this polite custom often ignored in america is universal abroad if one wishes to ask a social favor such as a card for a friend to a ball to which you yourself have been asked or a letter of introduction it is better to make the request by note if possible as this gives the other person more freedom to refuse if that seems necessary when one alludes to an entire family by name respect requires that the article the be prefixed one's friends are the smiths the browns etc overwhelming compliments 
profuse compliment is as much to be avoided as undue or untactful criticism we are annoyed by those who persistently overwhelm us with admiring comment on the other hand one should not hesitate to speak a sincere word that will give pleasure one may without apology tell a friend that her new hat is unusually becoming or her dress artistic there are people who pride themselves on never saying anything disagreeable and they succeed in being so very often and quite unconsciously because they lack savor arthur benson the english essayist has amusingly pointed out how dull society would be if we turned it into a chorus of indiscriminate praise on how delightful a is what a charming person is b how altogether lovely is c perhaps the wisest rule is to draw a sharp line between those who are entitled in a strict sense to the all-devoted attitude of affection and those whom we merely like and find entertaining even the most patent faults and shortcomings of the former must be sacred a friend conceals the weakness of a friend of the second class one may speak frankly though of course always in taste and without malice end of section 42 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Section 43 of Marion Harlan's Complete Etiquette. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tracy Butterick. Marion Harlan's Complete Etiquette by Marion Harland. Chapter 43 On Manner. While it is important to master the minutiae that govern the conduct of social life, it is well to remember that good manner is to be desired even above good manners. Not what she says, but the way she says it was the clever explanation made by an experienced society woman of the charm of a debutante. No one doubts this for a moment. One only has to recall the impression made now and then by a fine-mannered workman or a countrywoman who has never attended a function in her life. Such persons, by virtue of native dignity of bearing, by a beautiful simplicity and kindness of heart toward all men, would be home in any assembly worthy to receive them. One can fancy that Stella, whom Dean Swift loved, would have been at ease in any society even if she lacked her protector's instructions and fostering care. We are told that she has civility, repose, and humor, three great qualities that make for social success. A well-known woman describing those who possessed savoir-faire says, They have the genius of tact to perceive, the genius of finesse to execute, ease and frankness of manner, a knowledge of the world that nothing can surprise, a calmness of temper that nothing can disturb, and a kindness of disposition that can never be exhausted. Learning to Talk Well to learn to talk well and to listen well and to do either with grace as the conversational situation demands is a real accomplishment one writer on the subject of conversation has given excellent advice socialize every thought before you utter it in other words one should bear in mind as vividly as possible the probable direction and extent of the sympathies and interests of the person to whom one is speaking and endeavor not to let his words go far afield from those sympathies and interests conversation is essentially a partnership game and as in playing golf the one who is talking should not get too far away from his listener there have been people like coolidge who did not converse but who spoke habitually in monologues and spoke so brilliantly that society was glad to listen with ordinary men and women however there should be a give and take in listening try to catch plumply a ball tossed to you and in return try to pitch your own ball neither too high nor too low too soft nor too hard 
it is not necessary in order to be pleasant to make oneself what emerson has happily called a mush of concession do not be afraid to have convictions of your own and at the proper moment to express them clearly at the same time one should avoid a dogmatic manner and any assumption that one's own view is the only view worth having the saying stick your opinions in nobody's sleeve is to the point utter your own ideas frankly but do not force their acceptance on any one even a good idea is likely to lose by any suggestion of insistence it is well to make frequent use of the question form in the beginning of a new topic of discussion to ask do you admire forbes robertson rather than i admire forbes robertson because etc in the one case you courteously include in your talk the one whom you are addressing and in the other you simply use him as an audience for your own benefit people who are given to the latter form are usually those who are fond of talking constantly which it may be remarked is a dangerous thing to do the man or woman who says a great deal at one time is pretty sure to say something he will be sorry for besides from a strategic point of view the man who is always talking himself does not learn he has no chance to be finding where the other person stands while all the time he is setting himself up as a target a great teacher once said a wise man will hear and will increase learning a love of harmony not to talk constantly of one's self and one's affairs is of course a fundamental rule of good breeding and yet there are persons who know how to talk about themselves on occasions when it is proper to do so in a delightful way because they have the instinct for speaking simply and without conceit to speak of one's ills of any sort is ordinarily a mistake consume your own smoke to walk gently humbly and if possible gaily with other men is a charming rule for social conduct one should be a lover of harmony to differ abruptly from the one who is speaking may in rare instances be necessary but only then after all the person who is agreeable is one who agrees while one may not share one's neighbor's views in the whole one may often seize on some point of it with which to sympathize and on which to set the seal of one's approval the clergyman who at an evening party where a well-known woman had read the paper on sir oliver lodge and his experiments in the occult vehemently denounced all occultism doubtless felt that his office demanded this attitude but he made his hostess and the other guests exceedingly uncomfortable if anyone introduces a topic the reasonable inference is that he is interested in that topic and remark number two from you should not throw cold water on it do not merely listen but attend stretch mentally toward your companion be with him in thought find out where people are and meet them there only in this way will you yourself gain the full measure of what the other person has to give and be able to reply to the finer points of his remark a good rule in conversation is when in doubt keep still never be betrayed into talking merely because you are nervous arthur vincent speaks somewhere of the unhappy spectacle made by the shy man who attempts to cover his shyness by garrulty when you do speak take all the time there is that is to say do not feel hurried or flurried speak when you speak without fear and with dignity never press unduly any slight advantage you may acquire in conversation your companion is not your victim nor are you to shine as his superior a fine manner is made up of slight sacrifices if in spite of yourself you are drawn into a heated wordy and futile argument you are justified in assenting to any claims whatsoever your unwise companion may make it was the practice of stella says one of her biographers to agree with such persons as she said to save noise the telling of stories if you attempt to tell a story be sure in the first place that it is worth telling and in the second place that you know it thoroughly and in the third place that you tell it reasonably well 
but the social company that is transformed into a succession of good stories does not represent the highest social plane a particularly good story is always desirable if it comes in naturally to point some phase of a discussion that is in progress but a run of stories represents an intellectual descent in whatever you are telling or describing beware of too much detail remember the french proverb to tell all is to be tedious serenity and gentleness cheerfully accord the other person the last word in any discussion giving your own view once quietly and if it does not arouse interest do not insist on it never raise your voice to command attention never spoil a fine moment by any disagreeable allusions there are always some people who have the gift for introducing the subject of tomain poisoning during the fish course, or who, on an outing, make all of the other women uncomfortable by talking about snakes. Remember that comparisons are dangerous and that superlatives are also often the forerunner of embarrassment. Be prepared for surprises and do not allow them to throw you off your balance. Never allow yourself to become a fuss budget serenity is one great element of social charm de maurier tells us that trilby knew when to speak and when to keep silent george meredith in his delightful romance sandra baloney says of sandra she moved softly as if she loved everything that she touched a certain softness of manner is undoubtedly a large part of attractiveness but the sharp edge of self-assertion destroys the gentleness of hamlet's unhappy love is shown in the warning spoken before one of her entrances soft you now the fair ophelia remember says a modern writer on voice training that every time you speak you touch someone with your voice beware of giving out violent opinion before knowing where the other person stands this does not mean that you should be untrue to your own beliefs but that you should with one newly met cast about for at least a plank on which you two may stand in friendly relation it is the people who most accurately measure the common ground between them and the other people who make the most and the happiest friendships never command even one who is paid to serve you the same words in the form of a request are equally effective and much more credible to you and grateful to the persons to whom they are spoken english servants invariably say thank you for any information or direction given them but this smacks of servility and one hopes the custom will not be taken up in this country never begin a conversation with say as say marjorie in a group conversation be careful to include by voice and glance everyone in it say good-bye to all finally be sure as emerson says that people like a room better with you in it than out of it and when you leave a room learn to do it in a way that adds to the pleasure your presence has already given do not for one thing neglect to say good-bye to everyone present if the number is small the grace with which some people take leave amounts to an art some one has recorded with delight the exquisite laughing farewells of mrs browning end of section forty three Recording by Tracy Butterick. Section 44 of Marion Harlan's Complete Etiquette. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Daniel, New York City. Marion Harlan's Complete Etiquette by Marion Harlan. Self Help and Observation. To the uninstructed, socially, the bare rules and conventions regulating social life seem often meaningless and arbitrary. A careful consideration of these conventions, such as it has been the aim of this book to give, shows that no one of them is without a reason for its being. The classification, however, of social forms, together 
with the reasons governing these forms, does not provide a body of knowledge sufficient to serve as a guide in the manner of comporting oneself easily and to advantage socially. There are many situations and points of behavior that it is impossible for a book of etiquette to cover. The laws laid down are only a small social capital. They discuss the more obvious matters of social contact. Numerous points, and these of the finer sort, must be left without comment. In the treatment of these points and problems, the person desirous of solving them properly must rely largely on his own good sense. One must apply to social exigencies the same methods of reasoning that one applies in meeting the other exigencies of life. In a word, one must resort to the principle of self-help. Much too, and this in the pleasantest fashion, may be done to extend one's knowledge of good form by observation of people who have unusual tact and social discrimination. In every city, town, and village, there are such persons who are distinguished above their fellow citizens by social instinct, by the talent for performing gracefully and acceptably the offices of society. In differing degrees, but still perceptibly, these people, like the painter, the musician, the poet, are marked by a taste and a thirst for perfection. To render social life as interesting, as charming, as beautiful as possible, to make the social machinery run smoothly and without friction, this is their aim. Such people give quality to social intercourse. They observe the little amenities of life with grace. They know how to enter a room and how to leave it. They convey by the bow with which they greet one on the street the proper degree of acquaintanceship or friendship. They dress with propriety. They take by the forelock in the adoption of new devices for the entertainment of their friends. Their parties are the prettiest. Their houses are the most popular. Not necessarily clever of speech, they are clever in small and charming activities. They have a marked talent for all the little graces that make social intercourse easy and delightful. This talent, of course, cannot be communicated, but much may be learned by watching its operation. Certainly, one can gain from it a knowledge of particulars, of how to perform certain definite acts, even if the conquest of the method is impossible. It is not difficult in any community to discover people who approach, more or less, nearly the type described. They have a recognized distinction, to watch them, and, by this means, to wrest from them, a part at least of their secret, is the surest way for the individual, timid or unversed socially, to discover his own social power and to increase it. Doubtless, some of those who read this book may be disposed to ask why, in social life, so much stress is laid on comparatively small matters and why one cannot do as one pleases. To these, we recommend Gilbert Hamerton's delightful essay, Custom and Tradition, addressed, quote, to a young gentleman who had firmly resolved never to wear anything but a gray coat, end quote. We quote briefly, The penalties imposed by society for the infarction of very trifling details of custom are often, as it seems, out of all proportion to the offense. But so are the penalties of nature. Nature will be obeyed. Society will be obeyed. Society does not desire to exclude you because you will not wear evening dress, but the dress is customary, and your exclusion is merely a consequence of your nonconformity. The view of society goes no farther in this than the artistic conception, not very delicately artistic perhaps, that it is prettier to see men in black coats regularly placed between ladies round a dinner table than men in gray coats or brown coats. The uniformity of custom appears to represent uniformity of sentiment. Society does not argue the point with you, but only excludes you. The End End of section 44 Recording by David Daniel End of Marion Harland's Complete Etiquette by Marion Harland